Uh, today I want to bring you a message that I have entitled, The Better Father. The Better Father. You know, probably most kids have thought this, and many kids have even said the statement, if you really loved me. If you really loved me, you would, and then fill in the blank. Again, many children have said that. I, I would venture to say probably all children have thought that at some point in their life. If you really loved me, you would let me have chocolate cake three meals a day. If you really loved me, you would buy me the fast car. If you really loved me, you would let me go on this trip with all of these friends that you don't trust as far as you can throw them. If you really loved me, you would do this. Well, we know that as you become a parent and you live life, with that comes some wisdom. And you're able to look at a situation, and it's not that I don't love you the reason I don't do this. It's because I do love you is the reason I'm not going to allow you to do this. Well, the thing about us is, as many of us are adults in here, there's a few kids in, in the service with us today, but, you know, we can at times have that same belief toward God. Well, God, I, I'm going through a tough time. God, I don't understand why this hasn't worked out. God, do you really love me? God, are, are you holding out for me your, your best? God, do you really love me? And what we're going to see today is that how God uses discipline in our lives. You know, discipline is talked about a lot in Scripture. It talks about self-discipline that we are to have in our lives as we are living out our faith. There's instruction in there to parents about parental discipline that we are to have as we train up our children. But it also talks about the discipline that God gives to us, godly discipline. And that's what I want to talk about today because it's very intimate. It's a discipline that involves the relationship we have with him. It involves the relationship of a father and a child. So I'm going to begin in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. And I invite you to take your word of God, uh, take your Bible, turn it on, open it up, whatever you have today, and let's, uh, let's look at our text together, beginning in Hebrews 12, chapter 3. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Think about the one that laid down his life for you, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Powerful. Consider the sufferings of Christ, lest you become weary in your own soul. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. And this comes out of Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves... He chastens. He disciplines. Okay, that's not, chastens not a word we use a lot anymore. It, it means to discipline. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom the Father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjugation to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, 
but he for our profit that we may be partakers in his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that they... So so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Today, I want want us to examine God's discipline in our lives. And we're going to look at the reason for it, the relationship in it, and the result of it. And I want you today, I want you to be open to God speaking into your life. Because you may come into this place today, and for some reason you think God's turned his back on you. And I just want you to see today God's love for you even as he is bringing discipline into our lives. First of all, let's see the reason for divine discipline. Verses 3 through 5, the reason for divine discipline. See, discipline in our lives is not random, okay? God didn't pour out his wrath upon his son just because he was random, just because it was something that he wanted to do. No, he did it for us. There was a reason that he poured out his wrath upon Christ on the cross because he had to endure that so that we could be in a right relationship with Christ. Well, the reason God brings discipline into our lives could be various. Two of them that first come to mind is God will discipline us when there needs to be a correction, okay? There's sin in our lives. There's something in our life that doesn't honor God. It isn't what is asked of of a child of God. And God will discipline us. God will bring punishment into our lives, not because he hates us. He brings discipline and punishment into our lives because he's trying to correct an action or a thought that we are having, okay? We see that in our life. We see that in the way that we have to live in a society. If you leave here today and you're trying to go to lunch and you turn left and go south on Six Forks Road and you head to North Hills, but you do it at 80 miles an hour, okay? There is a possibility that a blue and white car is going to pull in behind you. Okay, and you're going to become very special to that officer today. Okay, you're going to, he's going to show you how much you mean to him that he's going to bring a correction into your life in the form of a ticket. Why? Because they say they've got to get your attention that what you are doing is dangerous. What you are doing can bring harm. Well, God does the same thing. God brings discipline into our lives when there needs to be correction. Because he is desiring, he's desiring for us to walk with him. Somebody asked me this question one time. Would you purposefully, if you had to, would you break your child's arm? I said, no. I wouldn't wouldn't break my child's arm. Then he said this way, would you break your child's arm trying to pull him out in front of a train? Well, yes. Yes. Yes, if, yeah, if I was trying to jerk them out from in front of a train, sure I would. Well, God brings discipline into our lives when he knows we're heading down a path that's going to bring harm to us, bring shame to his name. And again, we're going to see he does it because he loves us. So he does it for correction, but God also does it for instruction. For instruction, when he is teaching us things about ourselves he's teaching us our dependence upon him he's teaching about our propensity oftentimes to fall into sin but he also uses it to teach us things about himself his holiness his righteousness and what it means to with a full heart follow him and all of this all of this is to mature us in what we call christian sanctification it's a theological term. It's not a, not a heavy one. We think about when we trust Christ as our Savior, we call that justification. When we are in heaven for eternity with Christ, we call that glorification. 
That time between justification and glorification is called sanctification. Let me give you a, just a quick definition of what it means. It means to grow more like Christ. It means in our lives, even though we have a sin nature, even though we still have the possibility of sin in our lives, we are seeking to grow more and more like Christ as we follow him. Well, as we do this, God is teaching us, he's instructing us, he's correcting us to be more like him. And that is his will. That's why in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, it says, this is the will of God, our sanctification. So I'm going to talk more about the reason for God's correction and God's discipline in our life, but it's for your good. He, he's like a parent. See, you'll never understand this until we can come to the point in our faith where daily we can make these two claims. God, I know you are good, and I know you are God. I know you are good, and I know you are God. And I know that you love me too much. You are the better father. You love me too much to allow me just to pummeled on with no correction in a sinful life. You're going to bring correction into my life, and it is for my good. The reason for divine discipline. Secondly, let us see the relationship of divine discipline. Before I read the text again, I want to just be, be very clear. God hates sin. Okay, God, God hates sin, and God is ultimately going to punish sin. There's going to be an ultimate judgment upon sin. For the believer, the ultimate judgment on sin happened on the cross. But one day those who reject Christ, they're going to face a judgment because God is holy and he hates sin, and sin is not going to be in his presence. But our text reminds us today that we're in the relationship of a father and a child. That's why we use those terms, and that's why the Bible gives us us, those terms in our relationship with the father. Verse 6 says, for whom he loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not chasten? Okay? Again, it's the relationship of a father and a child. So God, when he brings punishment into our lives, he, he's not just up in heaven because he's mean. And he says, well, Scott, you sinned, pow. Jacob, you sinned, pow. I'm just going to send out lightning ball. I'm going to pop you because I'm mean and I'm hateful. No. God is doing it because he loves us. God is doing it because he cares for us. God is doing it because he wants us to grow in our faith with him. It is a punishment. It is a chastening. But again, it goes back to a, a purpose. You know, Revelation 3.19 talk, talks about the Laodicean church. You remember what church that was? It was the lukewarm church. Okay, but here's what it says, and no, God hasn't changed. It says that God's love and his discipline go hand in hand. His chastening and his love are together. So we can't separate that. Those whom he loves, he's going to bring discipline in their life. Again, not because he just, you know, somehow... He's happy because he can do that? No. But he does it for our good and for our growth. You know, my, my father, and if he's watching today, I, I, I love you, Dad. Uh, my, my dad was a disciplinarian. I'm thankful that, that he, he was. And, you know, my dad was an engineer. My, my dad, uh, you know, my, my joke that I tell him all the time is, you know why guys become engineers is because they don't have the personality to be undertakers. So they become engineers. And, you know, I, I never saw my dad cry. 
My, my, I once asked my mom about it. Mom said, yeah, she saw him cry when his parents died. Well, I was three and four when my grandparents on the Jackman side died. So I, I didn't remember that. I didn't know that. So it wasn't like, and I can cry anytime. I can get emotional. and So I never saw that with my dad except for when he would punish me. And there's another thing that parents say, and every child says, that's crazy. When a father or a mother says, this hurts me worse than it does you. I remember him telling me that, and I thought, that's crazy. Well, then you bend over. Let me whomp you a while, okay? Let's, let's test this. It was amazing. He would, he would spank me, and then he would turn me around. And he would immediately hug me, and he would be crying. And he would say, son, I have to do this. This, this may seem so in, just inconsequential right now, but you can't have this pattern in your life as you grow. So I've got to, it's a chastening. This has got to be in your life. Well, it says, if our earthly fathers do that, how much more will our heavenly father, because of his steadfast love, bring this into our lives? See, you are more than a creation. You are his creation. And he loves you as a child so much more. Some of you right now are sitting by your children. Hey, some of them are young and some of them aren't so young anymore, but you're sitting by your child. And as much as you say you love your child, your heavenly Father loves you so much more in such a deeper, more intimate way than our feeble human minds can understand. So it says here, if your earthly father brings discipline out of that love, how much more will your heavenly Father because of his love? That's the relationship of divine discipline. And third, let's see the result. What's what's the result of divine discipline? Verses 9 through 11. Furthermore, we have human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjugation to the Father of spirits and live? And live. So a result of God's discipline being in our life, his chastening us, his growing us through sanctification is to have life. I think we could put in there to have abundant life. Now, that, that doesn't mean we're, we're going to have all the wealth. It doesn't mean we're going to have all the stuff. But what God can bring, some, God, what God can bring into our lives is something that can't be bought, and that is satisfaction. It's contentment. Folks, I, I've met people through the years They had enough money to buy the building we're sitting in, but weren't satisfied. They weren't content with anything. And I've met people who have very little, and they were content with everything. God can bring us through his discipline, through we see his love for us, it can bring about an abundant life that brings contentment here upon the earth that we are his and he will never leave us. He can bring life. Verse 11, verse 10, for indeed, for a few days, our fathers chastened us, it seemed best to them, but he, God, for our profit, that we may be partakers in his holiness. Okay? This is our spiritual growth. Partakers in his holiness, that certainly begins at justification. It begins when we're saved that his righteousness is imputed to us. It carries with us as we grow in our faith here upon the earth. It is with us when we stand before the Father in judgment and he sees the righteousness of Christ, not our sin within us. 
But it is this spiritual growth that happens that we are able to endure and able to go through as a result of the discipline in our lives. And then finally, what is this, verse 11? Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, after it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Okay, what does that mean? What is the fruit of righteousness? That means that in our growth, we endure the discipline of God. In our growth, then we have a testimony to share with others. Others can see in our life that everything hasn't gone perfect. Everything hasn't gone right. It's not been, as I said last week, the sweet by and by pie in the sky that we have endured hardships, but yet they still see a hope in our lives that comes through our relationship with Christ. They still see a hope in our lives that is born out of the righteousness of Christ that we now have. And it speaks a powerful testimony to the world. Because God desires to use us to communicate his love, his fatherly love for the world around us. I I want you to turn back a few pages. For me, it's not very many, but go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And it really highlights this about how God uses his word to do this in our lives. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 16 and 17. We probably know it by heart. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Okay? What's doctrine? Doctrine is what's right. Okay? For reproof. What happens when we're reproof? It's showing us what's wrong. It's, the, it's the, the correction, which goes to next. For correction, this is how to get right. And then for instruction in righteousness, how to stay right. But again, why does God do this? What's the result of this discipline in our lives? Verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thoroughly equipped to take the gospel. Thoroughly equipped to live the gospel. Thoroughly equipped to share the gospel. See, I want you to understand that as a child of God, God has saved you. He's given you a story. And he's preparing you and he desires to use you. But just like the athlete has to train to be able to compete in the sport... So we have to train. So the athlete has to have discipline. So we have to have discipline. Why? That we may be complete, thoroughly equipped to go out and do what God has called us to do. But we've got to have his discipline coming into our lives to reach that point. Why? Because of a sin nature. And we all have the propensity to want to go our own way. But the Father loves us and brings us back. And when I was a, a sophomore at, at, at NC State, I was on the football team. And when I was a sophomore, we, we got a new coaching staff that, that came in. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love the, the position coach, the offensive line coach when I was a freshman. And we got a new coach by the name of Robbie Caldwell. He's gone on to win a couple national championships as the offensive line coach at Clemson. He's done pretty well. He's still coaching after all these years. I had him as a very young man, and he's not as young anymore there. But I, I, I remember with, with Coach Caldwell, I couldn't do anything right. I didn't tie my shoes right. I didn't walk right. I didn't talk right. He rode me about everything. And finally, at the, at the end of my sophomore season, I, I went in and met with him. And I said, hey, coach, I, I, I just want to let you know, man, th- thanks for everything you've done. But 
Uh, I'm going to ask Coach Sheridan for a release. I'm going to, um, you know, it wasn't a portal then. It was just, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find another school to transfer to. And, and he looked at me and he said, why? Why, why are you going to transfer? You got such a, a, a good career right here, a good possibility right here. Why in the world would you leave? I said, Coach, because it's pretty evident you hate me. You, you, you can't stand me. And he looked surprised. He said, are you kidding? He said, man, I love you. You're one of my favorite players. I, I love you more than you could ever imagine. I'm looking so forward to coaching you the next three years. Well, I was confused. I, I just don't understand. Coach, you ride me about everything. And Mary, he said, Marty, I'm hard on you because I love you. And I see the potential that's buried within you. He said, son, when I stop riding you, that's when you better transfer. Because when I stop coaching you, that means I've given up on you. And you better go somewhere else. I've never forgotten that. He said, because I love you, that's why I can be hard on you. That's why I demand from you a level of excellence. That's why I want to see you compete at the highest level. I've thought about that a lot of times. When it comes to the way God deals in our lives. God doesn't bring correction. He doesn't bring punishment. He doesn't, he doesn't bring testing into our lives to help us grow because he hates us. He allowed his son to die for you. How many people have done that for you? He allowed his child to die for you, to demonstrate his love for you. And he says, I love you too much to leave you in sin. I, I love you too much to just to let you wonder about. I love you enough to bring this correction into your life because I see what you can be. I see the testimony that you could go share. I see the impact you could make for the gospel. And that's my desire for you. What, what did he say? The will is our, his will is our sanctification. And our taking his message into the world. So today, celebrate his love. Celebrate his love. Be thankful. That it says, whom he loves, he chastens. Let's be thankful for that today. You know, I'm going to challenge you on a Tuesday message this week, a Thanksgiving message. You know, I think part of the, with it being 2020, and 2020 has been a crazy year, okay? It's been a crazy year. Um kind of the trend is let's jump to Christmas. Let's go ahead and decorate early so we can have joy and things. I think that's great. I love Christmas. I'm not a Grinch. But let's not miss Thanksgiving. Let's not miss an opportunity to thank God for all he's done. Even in a crazy year, let's thank him for all he's done. And let's make sure this week we thank him that he loves us enough to discipline us to bring testing into our life because he knows what we can be. Let's pray together. Father.